Yeah, it's been a it's been a long one, but it's been very productive and very fruitful, and I'm and I'm glad about it. Grab your Bibles and go with me to James chapter one, and we're gonna read verses five and six. James chapter one. And we will read verses five and six in your hearing. How y'all doing, 12 o'clock? Y'all doing good? I'm glad about 10 of y'all are doing fine. I don't be saying nothing back. You got, if you have James, say, I have it. Beginning at verse 5, it says, If anyone of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given unto him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, being driven and tossed by the wind. I want to use as our subject today, I need wisdom. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I need wisdom. Okay, they didn't respond. So look at the other neighbor and say, neighbor, for real, this year? It can't be like last year. I need some wisdom. I need some wisdom. Last week, we started our series, Level Up, and we talked about clarity. We talked about vision, and we... We explained it and we talked on the reality that vision is just not sight, but it's clarity. Because what good is it to be able to see something that you can't clearly identify? You want to make sure that you are clear on what it is that you're looking at. And then this past Wednesday, we dealt with how God has created and designed you to be a resource. Because you realize that God has gifted you and anointed you with something special and something unique. And with that being in mind, God can bless you if you allow him to use you and your gift. The Bible says the Queen of Sheba actually comes to Solomon and asks him of his wisdom. And the Bible says how Solomon blesses her. And when she sees how organized he is and how structured he is and how the servants are serving and how the food was laid out, that the Bible said there was no more breath in her. She had such an experience with Solomon that it took her breath away. And I believe that God is allowing you to be a resource this year that people who come in contact with you, their breath will be taken away. But today we're talking about wisdom. And if you really think about it, what's the use of having clarity? Or what's the use of having vision? What's the use of being a resource if you make poor decisions? We have to make better decisions regarding our lives and if we're going to be better decision makers, we have to have wisdom. So in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, if you want to go there with me, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you're reading from the King James Version, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. If we're going to have wisdom, the first thing we have to identify is this. We have to start with God, and we must have a reverence for God. We live in a culture and in a time now where people don't have a high respect or reverence for God. We have people who downplay it. They say things like church isn't necessary. I don't need God. I don't believe in God. And the reason why we have the world that we have and the lives that we have is because God is not number one. But if we posture ourselves that God is priority and that he is in our lives, our lives will be different. Now, when you deal with this, it says the beginning of knowledge. It means to start or the head. It means um, it means to be the best. It means to be at top. So what he's saying is that when we have a reverence for God, that's the beginning of where wisdom is birthed in our lives. See, the thing is, is God is not trying to be on a list more than he is trying to be the center. If you think about it, if we had a list, right, one, two, three, four, five, right, we have God number one, family number two, children, I mean, career number three, 
um, and um, workout number four. If we had that list, then what happens is in our lives, we, we have problems because certain weeks demand uh, different energy on different issues, right? So something goes on in the family. Now, the family needed this week. And so where did God go? Oh, God dropped the number three because, you know, it was family and then the kids and then I have my job or then something happens on your job. And so the job becomes number one that week and God is number four or maybe he number two. And so he's always is fighting for that number one spot. God is not trying to fight for a number one spot more than he is trying to be the center. When God is the center and there are branches that come off of that, then the family comes off that, money comes off that, career comes off that, children come off of that. So there's no decision that you make that God is not in it because he's at the core. So God is trying to be the core, not number one. So when God is the core, he's involved in every decision you make. So people will say stuff like, man, you got to pray about that too? Yep, because I got to make sure that I walk in wisdom. And so we want to make sure that we walk in wisdom and live a life that God wants us to have. And so it not only talks about wisdom in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, but then he goes to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7, and that says wisdom is the principle thing. Therefore, get wisdom, but in all you're getting, get an understanding. It is nothing like having clarity or insight about something. And to acquire wisdom is important. That's why the Bible says in Matthew 7 and 7, ask and it shall be given. Seek uh, uh, no, and you will find. Knock and the door shall be open. We have to become a generation and a people that begins to seek God. Not just come to church because coming to church is not good enough if that's the only thing you do. Church attendance is great. You're going to learn about God. You're going to learn some scriptures. Uh, I pray for you leave with something that you can lead, live with. That's what this is about so that you can be a better Christ follower, a better Christian. However, just coming to church just for one hour, for an hour and 15 minutes, one day out of the week doesn't suffice. Think about it. Could you survive off a week if you only ate one meal one day? You couldn't. That's why the Bible says when Jesus taught his disciples, was to pray, he said, when you pray, he said, give us this day our daily bread because you need to be eating on something every day. If it's a devotional, if it's a scripture, if it's a video, if it's a sermon, if it's a message, something every day needs to be deposited in your spirit if you're going to live a strong and thriving spiritual life and we have to go after God. We have to go after God in prayer. We have to go after God in our fasting. That's why we're consecrating this year so that we can make sure that this year truly is the year that every everything changes. We want God to be in our lives. We want God to be in our family. We want God to be in our careers, but we want God in, in our lives in such a way that we experience joy and peace in ways that we've never experienced before. We want the power of God to flow in our lives, but if we're going to get that, we have to go after it. God wants us to go after him. What woman wants a man who doesn't chase him? If he says he's interested, but he doesn't call and he doesn't text and he doesn't do any of those things, you come to the conclusion that he may not be interested because if he's interested, he's going to pursue. You can't tell me you're interested in a football when you're always looking at basketball. You cannot tell me you're trying to bring your grades up when you're always sleeping. You can't tell me you're trying to get better when you're always drinking. You can't tell me you're trying to be faithful when you always got other numbers in your phone from other people you shouldn't be talking to. Your actions have to follow your words. You didn't say nothing right there, but I'm going to move right on because I'm trying to get on home. So at the end of the day, we have to do better because our lives have to follow our actions. And so the Bible says that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. One writer said this, obtain wisdom, right? At the cost of all you own, get discernment. In other words, are you willing to give up everything to get to God and to get everything that he has for you? But the enemy doesn't want you to pursue God. That's why he throws the church at you at a way to make you think that the church is about something else. And so they say stuff like, oh, see, the preachers sleep with women or they steal money or they pimp the people or they lie over there or they manipulate people. And so I don't go to church and you don't realize that church is a place that 
God has designed for you to hear his word. So if I don't have insight and I don't hear the word, then I don't get it. The Bible says it like this. How faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now the Bible goes on to say this. Well, how can you hear if you don't have a preacher? And how can he preach unless he be sent? So at the end of the day, the reason why I have faith is because I got a preacher who's been called. And when you're under someone who's been called, it begins to ignite your faith. So the enemy doesn't want you to come to church. He wants you to be like, ooh, it's raining outside. Ooh, it's cold. Ooh, the wind is too hot. I'm going to stay in. I'm going to watch online. It's easier that way. But some people say, you know what? I understand there's a blessing when I'm present in the house. So I'm going to get out this nice, comfortable, warm bed. And I'm going to get dressed and get down to 8328 Park Lane because I believe God's going to meet me there because you're trying to seek him. The enemy wants us to live in ignorance. I need to reteach some things. So just bear with me for a moment. Some of you have heard this before, but some of you haven't. So let me just dig through this a minute. The enemy lives in darkness, darkness. When you when you read the Bible and you see the word darkness, it represents ignorance. It represents someone who does not know. The devil is the principality of darkness or he's the principality of ignorance. So as long as you are ignorant, listen to me, he has legal right to stay so if you stay ignorant about your money based on how God says to do it the enemy gonna stay right there in your money because you are ignorant ignorant spiritually ignorant regarding your money if you are spiritually ignorant about your decision making then the enemy has a legal right to stay there and we have to get past pride Yes, because you don't want certain people to know you don't know something. You have to say, God, I don't know, and I need you to teach me. Because the enemy lives in ignorance. He lives in darkness. The Bible says in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. A few verses down, it says this, and the, the darkness comprehended it not. In other words, when light appeared that darkness went away in other words darkness can't handle light so once you have an understanding about something darkness has to leave or ignorance has to leave because you can't unknow something when you have experience darkness goes away and so what happens is the enemy, as long as he can keep you away from the place that would teach you how to grow spiritually, the enemy will always run through your life, always try to get you at a place. That's why he don't want you to come to church. That's why he don't want you to read your Bible. That's why when you read your Bible, you get sleepy. That's why when you get on your knees, you know, your back start hurting. Why? Because he don't want you to get closer to God because once I know it, it's a wrap because knowledge truly is power so he wants us to stay ignorant but here can I dig a little deeper so here it is ignorance in of itself the root word means to ignore so when you deal with ignorance and the root word being ignore some people are not doing it not because they don't know better some people not doing it because they're not applying. They know they're supposed to do it, but they intentionally not look at it. So you know you're supposed to be living a, a certain life. You know you're not supposed to be running with the folks you're running with. You know you're doing stuff you're supposed to be doing. And when people bring it up, people are like, come on, change the subject. Let's talk about something else. Because you don't want them to rub you the wrong way. But you know better. You know you're not supposed to be with him. You know you're not supposed to be with her. You know you're supposed to be living a life of righteousness. But no, we don't want to do that. So we ignore it. And since we ignore it, the enemy sits there and he sits in our lives. Not because you are ignorant, but because you ignore it oh I know I'm supposed to do this yeah pastor I know keep praying for me and we keep using the line God know my heart he know my struggle God been seeing your struggle for the past 15 years and he's sick and tired of you using your struggle as an excuse to do better uh, you got to change this year you got to step up your game you got to change up you got to level up baby you just got to level you got to just do what you got to do so he, 
He goes on and he begins to speak about this. And so if we want God to use us, we have to understand that we have to live a certain life. Now, the problem and the challenge that we're having within the church today is that we come or we see where places where everybody preaches about the blessing and you're going to be blessed this week and God has a blessing for you. The Bible says this, that he reigns on the just and the unjust. He reigns on those who are doing right and he blesses those who are doing right and he blesses those who ain't doing right. But there are certain blessings that are only re- that's only reserved for those doing right. And so when you only preach a blessing message to a disobedient generation, that disobedient generation begins to claim blessings. They're not legally You can't legally attain that. You can't, you, you can't get access to that. If something were to happen to me, God forbid, only my kids and my wife will have access legally to get what I have. My cousins they can't even get it unless it's in the will because you had to be in a certain family structure. And when you are a child of God, there are certain blessings and favor that God will extend to you that he will not extend to those who are not walking right. Somebody say sanctification. Now, this is a word you don't hear in church much, but it literally means to be separated. It's a process. So, in other words, if you came to my house and you said, hey, pastor, can I get something to drink? I said, sure, not a problem at all. I walk in the kitchen. I reach into the sink where all the dirty dishes are, take out a dirty glass, go to the refrigerator, pour you some juice, and then give you the glass. My question is, would you drink it? I know the answer is no, because you could say, why in the world are you going to give me a dirty glass when you should have some clean glasses in the cabinet, okay? That's what we do to God. We want to hang out in dirty environments, in dirty cultures, hang around dirty people because you like that dirty fork and that dirty spoon and that dirty plate because y'all got relationships because the last meal y'all did it together. And so since you don't want to separate yourself, now you want to be used. God says, I can't use you because you're dirty. What I got to do is reach up to another person who's been separated sanctified for my use and if you want God to use you you're going to have to come from among them and be ye separate as the Bible says saith the Lord and so here it is that's why God wants to use us but you can't live dirty that's why I'll be confused because you one day you here or one day you're there and God says we can't do that that's why he says ask in James if any man lacks wisdom let him ask God who gives it liberally or without restriction God will give it to you if you ask, but this word ask deals with someone who seeks it out, someone who is going after it. God wants to bless us, but we have to go after it, and we go through it through prayer. We think prayer is an event. We don't think prayer is really fun. You come to prayer, it's quiet, it's boring, it's not exciting, it don't have no fire. But the problem is we don't know how to pray except when we're asking God for something. So until we're in trouble, God, I need your help. God, give me a job. God, help me out. Please leave me alone. You know, you know the devil on me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. <laughs> and you're doing all this stuff, but it ain't working because you ain't got no prayer life. But when you have a prayer life, when you go before God and you have a prayer life, what happens is things are released to you because you have a relationship because you've been talking. It's interesting how we want to claim it, but we haven't been praying. And he says, and when you pray and ask God for wisdom, he's going to give it to you because wisdom is a gift. You can't work for wisdom. God has to give you wisdom. You want in this year, you want to make the right decision about your life and about the thing you need to do. So he says, I'm going to give it to you. But when you ask for it, verse six, hear me, um, but let him ask in faith. With no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave. It's like a wave of the sea being driven and tossed by the wind. Here it is. You come to God. You're going through. God, how do I handle this situation? But the problem is you're not asking God really for wisdom because you're trying to get established. You're asking God for wisdom because you want comfort. So when you want comfort, you adjust to what's comfortable. 
Okay, all right. So, so what happens is you don't, you don't ask in faith, you ask in doubt. So now he says you become like a wave. So waves are only produced off wind. Mm. So depending on how the wind blows depends on where you are that day. So Monday, you with God. 8, 3 p.m. Monday, you with the devil. 6 p.m., you got Jesus again. Tuesday morning, you back with the devil. Okay, that ain't good enough. 8 o'clock, you cuss somebody out. 9 o'clock, you trying to pray for your cousin. You back and forth because you're allowing wind, spirits to move and adjust you from place to place. And God says you got to stop all this moving and you got to get yourself established. And then I'll give it to you because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And he can't receive anything from God because God don't know where to drop the blessing because he don't know where you're going to be. So he says, he says, when you ask, you got to ask and you have to ask with faith without doubting. We have to start believing God again. I'm sorry. I told the church Friday, we believe in miracles here. I know people don't believe in miracles. People don't believe in miracles so they need one. It's interesting. I don't believe God healed them. Yeah, let you be in a hospital. You be, Lord, I need you to perform a miracle. You want everybody to pour all in your head. You want everybody to come by. You asking every preacher, every bishop, everybody who know Jesus, even if they're half safe, just believe God that he's going to work on my behalf because now you need a miracle. Isn't it interesting that God is trying to give us to a place where we are established and we are growing in our faith with him. We not only believe in miracles, we believe God delivers because people are dealing with some demons in this room and you need God to get them demons up out of your spirit. The Bible says that when a, a demon or a spirit is cast out of a man, the Bible says that he goes out of the man, but he hangs out in the suburbs. He hangs out in the hood. He hangs out in the neighborhood. And then he comes back to the house. And when he sees that the house is clean and empty, he says, well, ain't nobody here. So I'm going to invite seven more devils stronger than me. Lord Jesus. So now your fight is stronger than it's ever been. That's why you are coming to church and then you get set free. Go back in stuff you should have never been in. Now it's harder for you to come because you got more demons you fighting. And so after a while you have so many demons in your spirit that you become like the man who's in the graveyard in Mark chapter 5. And when Jesus said, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion for we are many. He says, I don't care how many demons are in you. I came to cast you out. But they say, wait a minute, Jesus. Can we go into them pigs? He said, go. And they leave and jump in a herd of pigs. And all of the pigs jump over the cliff. Here's a praise report. Them pigs showed you something. Those pigs showed you what should have happened to you. Ah, uh, see, them pigs killed themselves, but the reason why you still living is because God gave you enough grace to fight your demons until Jesus got to you to say, come out of him and come out of her. And now Jesus, the Bible says he's in his right mind. I believe God's about to give you your right mind and give you wisdom because we believe that God still delivers. He still sets free. I don't care what your struggle is. I don't care what it is. I'm not judging you. I'm telling you that we have to get free. We not only believe in miracles, we believe that God uh, delivers. We believe that God heals. So we don't care what kind of disease you have. We believe that God is able to do anything but fail. The Bible says he was wounded for our transgression and bruised for our iniquities and our chastisement of, of our sins was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. I believe that Jesus took a strike for my healing. As a matter of fact, let me get a little doctorial here. I learned that there are 39 categories in the medical field. Am I right about that, doctor? Uh, yeah, there are 39, uh, 39 categories in the medical field. It's interesting that Jesus got 39 stripes. Oh, y'all don't know how to shout when you're supposed to. I don't know what disease you had, but it was in one of them stripes when he got it. So by his stripes. I don't know which one it is, but it's one of them. By his stripes, we are healed. 
And so we believe that God heals, but we got to ask for this in faith without doubting. So when we don't get it, we still have to believe he's able to provide it. And God wants to provide wisdom in this house. He wants to provide wisdom and clarity for you. He wants you to walk in a, in a season of your life and at this time of your life with so much clarity and so much discernment that you can sense when the enemy is up to something. So you don't have to retaliate. You will be prepared before it happens. See, I pray God begins to deal with you that you see the demons you got to deal with before you even get the work. I, I pray he shows you the problem before you even walk up to your cubicle. I pray he shows you what's happening with your children before your children even know what's happening with them. I pray God begins to give you wisdom in this page and season of your life. Wisdom. Somebody say, I need wisdom. So now I thought about this. I said, God, how can we make this applicable? Because this is information, but how would I do to walk away? And so I thought about David, and David is called of God. He's a king of Israel, a king of Israel, and God anoints him to be the king at that time after Saul. And so the Philistines ends up having the Ark of the Covenant, and so David goes to get the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament was a gold box. It was overlaid with gold made out of shittim wood or acacia wood, depending on what version of the Bible that you're reading. And uh, it was overlaid with gold, representing the wood, representing humanity, the gold, representing divinity, kind of talking about Christ, who was both man and God, and all of that. Anyway, so it had angels on the top and angel wings, and, and it had rings on the side. And so the way the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be carried was they were supposed to take the staves and go through the rings and then lift it on their shoulders to carry the presence of God because God designed his presence to be carried by men and women that has been created in his image. And so what happens is uh, David gets a little arrogant and a little, because, you know, sometimes if you let it, success will get to you. And so he says, you know, well, we got to go get the Ark of the Covenant. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go down there. We're going to make this little cart and we're going to handle God that way. So let me break this down to you. What's happening is a cart is a man-made structure that has a system of wheels that moves it from one place to the next. So what we have is a man-made structure, number two, a man-made system. Uh, so now they said we're going to put God on our man-made structure and our man-made system and we're going to pull God where we want him to go. But the problem is it's not only a man-made system and a man-made structure. Uh, the problem is they got it pulled by animals. So I got a man-made system, man-made structure, pulled by animals and that's the problem with the church. We're trying to put God on something he never said to put him on. And instead of having people who have intelligence, we are following people who have instincts. We have leaderships that are nothing, they're nothing but animals. They don't, they devour everything. They just eat up everything. They destroy anything. When they're hungry, they'll eat whatever they need to eat to survive. That's why I was telling the church, now I'm going to be honest with you and I'm going to say the service as I say it to other ones. This weekend, Friday night, the power of God came in here. It's about 600, 700 people here Friday night and God had his way. And I said, listen, this event was not designed to take up an offering, but if I I was that trifling. I could have I could have raised some serious money. Y'all ain't helping me. The I could have said the Lord said two hundred dollars, and people would have gave two hundred dollars on Friday whether they had it or not. But I told them this event was not about money. This is why we have to have people in position that are clear and they're not greedy and they're not covetousness and they're trying not to rape people and hurt people. I'm not a perfect pastor. What I'm just trying to say is we got to have more people in the pulpits who care about the people and say, look, God, I'm glad you moved. Yesterday we had lunch that the church paid for. The VIPs didn't even pay for that. Why? Because we got people who are generous, who give, who give their offers and their tithes and because of that we're able to be a blessing and so what happens is when you have animals in the in the pulpit or animals in leadership they end up stumbling yes yeah. so you stumbled and slept with a member you stumbled and ended up drinking you y'all ain't helping me you stumble up stealing money you you stumble up having a text message you shouldn't have you 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 stumble to have pictures of somebody's body in your page in your phone that you shouldn't have had because you wasn't operate as an intelligent human being you were acting like an animal 
animal and you're hurting people. And because of that, the Bible says that the Ark of the Covenant slides off the, the, off the cart and also a person reaches out to stop it and he dies because David got too arrogant too early. So now people are dying in church because we have animals preaching. You strong, but you stubborn. You gifted and you're arrogant and nobody can't tell you nothing. And yet you're hurting people and us a name means strength. And I believe he said, God, because you're trying to get off what we created, I'm going to put you back in your place. And when he touched it, he died immediately. And the Bible said it hit David. And David said, oh, my God, what have I done? God, apologize. I, I don't know what got into me. I can't even take the presence of God home. I'm going to take it to Obed-Edom's house. So they take the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, and they take it to Obed-Edom's house. While the presence of God is at Obed-Edom's house, God blessing O. God open doors for O. O, 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 o just getting favored and God just opening. Hey, O was going on. Ooh, Lord, the Lord moving over here. I'm so glad. And see, you, you want to be around people who, who actually live in the presence of God because they bless. You want to see... I'm trying to tell you, you got to make sure you sit by the right people in church because sometimes you're running on low. You just need to be next to somebody who's operating in the overflow so I can get a little something. So if you rub elbows, yes, Lord, I take that because I, I believe that where two or three are gathering in his name, he'll be in the midst. You need to be sitting by the, the right people. So the Bible says that, that Obed-Edom is being blessed and David says, you know what? You know what? We got to get this together because if we want the presence of God in our lives and we want to be blessed, we got to make sure we posture ourselves for God's presence to be in our lives. And it comes through obedience. So David says, you know what, God? I messed up and I handled you wrong. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to get it right because now I'm wiser. The last time I did it, I didn't handle this right. The last time you had that conversation, that conversation didn't go the way you wanted to. The last time you went over there to do what you wanted to do, it didn't work out because you didn't handle it with wisdom. But isn't it good that God will use a mistake to teach you what you need to do next time? And when you look over your life, some of us have some scars and some of us got a degree from the school of the hard knocks that say, yep, I did that. I bumped my head enough times to know that I have to do some things differently. So David says, you know what we're going to do? We're going do this right he calls he gets on his phone he calls the chief priest and he says listen I need y'all to meet me downtown on Main Street and I need you to get the musicians and I need you to get the dancers and I need you to get the praise team and I need you to get the band and I need you to get first touch and I need you to get security I need you to get everybody who's on this and we're going down to Old Bad Edom's house and the Bible says that they have the stage and put it in the in the Ark of the Covenant and they pick it up and they begin to carry it so now David has now positioned himself Himself to get the presence of God back into his house oh my God so when he does this the Bible you got to read your Bible the Bible says that every seventh step he starts praising God now here it is every seven steps that had to be a long trip he took seven he took six steps and the seventh step he started dancing he took six steps and the seventh step started dancing he took six more steps and the seventh step he started praising God because he said God I'm not even supposed to be here but look at how far you've brought me David took a praise break every seven steps and we can't take a praise break every seven minutes but when you think about what God has done for you in your life, you don't need a praise team to push you. All you got to do is start thinking about what God has done and how far he has brought you. Oh, my God. God, thank you for what you did. You didn't have to do it, but you did. And I'm so glad you did. And so the Bible says that he starts praising God to the point that he gets into Jerusalem, the city of David. And he begins to praise God so hard because the presence of God is back. But you don't know how to appreciate God. God's presence if you didn't lose it. 
Hey, my God. I remember early in my ministry, early in my walk with God, I remember I was so sold out for God, doing everything I had to do, living the best way I could. And then a season in a time of my life, I slipped up and did something I had no business. Uh, ended up in some trouble. Ended up in a very low place. Uh, and I felt like God left me. And I felt like I would never get back to where I was supposed to be. I felt like I was losing everything I worked for and everything that I wanted. And then one day God said, no, nah, son, I didn't leave you. I just had to teach you what it felt like not to have me. So you can appreciate me next time. So the next time a temptation come, I'll say the devil is a liar. Because I know how much that costs. When you've lost it, you can appreciate it when you get it back. And the Bible shares with us that he starts praising God so much that he comes out of his clothes. And his wife, who was, by the way, a setup, says, oh, look at the king. Oh, isn't, aren't you so kingly that you would dance like that? He said, God chose me over your daddy. Let me put the pin right here. Understand that the children of Israel wanted a king. And they wanted a king so bad that they went to God and said, God, give us a king. He he said you choose so they chose Saul but God after Saul made his mistake God said I'm gonna choose my king and he chose David as a teenager he wasn't the son of Saul he ended up being the son-in-law of Saul but yet he wasn't in line to be king so when David looks at his wife and said God chose me what he's saying is I ain't even supposed to be here but look at what God did and you think I'm gonna sit here and act like God didn't put me here bump you if you think this is bad wait till next week I'm gonna be more undignified than this is there anybody in this room that can say I ain't even supposed to be here right now somebody who can say pastor if you only knew if you can say oh my god I don't look like what I've been through I'm not gonna sit here and act like he didn't do it I ain't supposed to be here and I will bless the Lord at a time I'm gonna give God praise like I never have because I got his presence back give your neighbor a high five and say I need wisdom <laughs> And so now David comes back and he says this. He says, oh, I got this because David is not only a warrior, but he's a worshiper. So he goes home and he gets his pen and he starts writing. He starts writing this. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and those that dwell therein for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters and then he says this who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord he who has clean hands see you can appreciate where you are now because you know your hands was dirty but God now gave you clean hands and he can begin to raise you because you have wisdom you didn't have before and people People want to judge you, but don't worry about it. My hands are not only clean, but I got a pure heart as well. And the Bible says, who shall receive a blessing from the Lord? And that's me. Hold on. But we are the generation that seeks his face. Oh, Jacob. What do you mean? We're going to seek God like we never saw him before. We're going to seek him. We're going to go after him. Because this is what our generation is supposed to do. And when you start seeking God, things begin to shift. And you begin to see God differently. That's why David said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. You don't make the object bigger than what it is. You only magnify the size of the object when you focus on it. And so now God begins to magnify himself. And David says, you know what, God? I thank you because you've done so much. And, and God begins to speak to David. And David says, lift up your heads. O ye gates, and be lifted up. E ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in here it is when my get my life together and i get his presence back he keeps me in the posture where i'm always looking up and so since i'm looking up i hear god said since you sent praises up i'm about to send blessings down and god said i'm getting ready to come and sit on you because you made room for me because you said you wanted me i need five people to say i need wisdom grab your neighbor right quick and say neighbor 
2019 going to be different for me because I'm getting ready to make the best decisions of my life. I'm getting rid of stuff I don't need no more. I'm cutting off who I need to cut off. I'm walking away who I need to walk away from. I'm going to forgive whoever I need to forgive. I'm going to have whatever conversation I need to have. But as for me and my house, we going to serve the Lord. Make your mind up today. But I'm going higher. I feel God getting ready to move us to another level. Grab your neighbor. Say, neighbor. I'm going higher. I'm going higher than I ever been. Y'all need to keep up with me. Say, neighbor, hang out with me. I'm getting ready to go higher. I'm getting ready to go to the next level because eyes have not seen and ears have not heard what he has for me. Somebody say, yes. Yes, God. Yes, God. Say, I'm going higher. Say, I'm going higher. Give somebody high five. Say, I need wisdom. I feel another elevation in my spirit. He's getting ready to do it. Say, yes, God. Everybody stand on your feet. Somebody just took their seventh step. Somebody just took their seventh step. I'm not supposed to be here today. I'm not supposed to be here, but thanks be unto God who gives us the power. Yes, God. Praise Him to the changes. Praise Him till He opens up heaven on your behalf. Let everything that has breath give God praise where you are. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm going to give God a praise for where he brought me from. But I'm not only going to give God a praise for where he brought me from, I'm giving him a praise for what he's getting ready to come into. Because I need him to sit on me right through here. Come on, let's give God praise where you are. One, two, one. this look at I'm serious I just heard this look at your neighbor and say neighbor I'm never going to do that again because I'm bigger than that I learned too much lessons this season no repeats in this season no repeats I'm not going to see the enemies you see today you will see no more I'm not looking at that devil ever again in my life and this praise is going to be like Miriam grabbing that tamarind. Thanking him for what you brought you through. Hey! Give God praise where you are. Listen, 
some of y'all just looking. I'm not trying to be carnal, but you can't be like at the school dance, leaning on the wall, looking at somebody else dance. I don't care if you don't get on the floor, dance in your corner. I need everybody in this room to move some kind of way. If you don't know the church dance, clap. Rock side to side, wave, do the cabbage. I don't care what you do, just do something. One, two, one, two, three, go. Lift your hands. God, we thank you for your wisdom. Ah. Father, we thank you for your wisdom. And we thank you for what you've done. We pray, God, you release a spirit of wisdom in this house. Thank you for what we've learned. But we thank you for greater clarity and greater insight and greater revelation for where we're going. We come against the spirit of ignorance. And we come against the spirit of of those who continue to ignore what they should do. We pray for surrender in this room. We pray for surrender. We pray for surrender. We pray for surrender. And God, we thank you for what you're doing in this place even now. How you're healing now. You're restoring now. You're delivering now. You're imparting now. You're downloading something right now. And we thank you for what you're doing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. For what you're doing in this place. And God, we release an anointing that destroys the yoke that tries to keep your people in bondage. Free that man. Free that woman. Let them let go of the past. Let them let go of the hurt. They have to move into a whole nother season. Another page. Another chapter. We thank you for releasing wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get it and get an understanding. Make it clear. Make it easy to understand and comprehend. I need everyone to repeat after me. Say, God, I'm a sinner. And I need you to save me. 
I've done wrong. I haven't done everything right. And I need you to save me. Come into my life. Make me brand new. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And you got up three days later with all power in your hand. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for giving me another chance. I believe it and I receive it. And I am saved in Jesus name. Everybody say amen. Come on, put your hands together and give God praise where you are. Listen, if that was the first time you've ever prayed that prayer because you knew your life wasn't right, we open this altar for you because you can't get this wisdom. You can't walk in this, this anointing. You can't walk in your call. You can't do what you need to do without Jesus. You can't do it by yourself. I know you're strong. I know you're intelligent. I know you're brilliant. I know you have charisma. But you can't do it if you don't have God. So if you're here today, no matter how old you are, no matter where you are in your life, you say, hey, today's the day I need to give my life to God. I want you to raise your hand where you are, saying, today is the day I want to give my life to Jesus. Don't be ashamed. Let's make it public. Where are you? Let's give God praise. Where are you? Are you here saying, hey, I want to give my life to God? 